bless you, my friend and sister Sharon. And today we are discussing why many people struggle with prayer. Prayer simply means that we are talking to God. But one of the most important Important things that we are not hearing enough of is learning how to listen to God after we have petitioned him. And let me give you six ways that we petition God so that you and I understand very clear, beloved, that the Bible does tell us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, that we should pray without ceasing. But how is it possible? I'm going to give you six things that we do most commonly, actually five things, most commonly when we go to God. We are giving him our cares, the things that we care about. We are speaking to him about our burdens, the things that have us heavy and weighed down. We're asking questions. We are praying for others. And we are going to God in faith with thanksgiving and with praise. These five things, beloved, is the primary conversation that we have with our God. But here is a very important thing for us to remember, because I'm going to give you uh, five reasons why most people struggle with prayer. But Jesus first, he told us in Matthew chapter 6, after his disciples uh, saw Jesus praying, and when he finished, they asked him, you know, you know, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, pray this way, our Father, which art in heaven, and this is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, is so important because Jesus went on to tell them when you pray, go into your secret place or go into your closet. That's what he said. And shut the door. And he then told them, and this doesn't necessarily mean, beloved, that, that we literally have a prayer closet. I know many people do, and it's awesome, especially when you go in and you, you know you just need to get quiet and really just seek God and and, and meditate on his goodness and, and, and petition him. But for some people, they may not have a closet. That could be one reason why people are under condemnation because they they don't have a closet. They live in a closet, literally. I know, uh, beloved, people don't believe it, but some people do sleep in a closet because that's all that they have. Someone let them borrow it so that they're not homeless. So what if a person doesn't have a decorated closet with scriptures, you know, that they have placed everywhere in the in the little closet and a cute little set of flowers and, you know, all these words on the wall? What if they don't have one. So we know that it doesn't mean literally necessarily, but what Jesus was teaching them is that prayer is private. It's not something that we go out and make a big scene of ourselves. Um, and you know, we, we see so many people, especially in a lot of the charismatic churches where they get the microphone and this person is going on and on and on. And it sounds so wonderful. It sounds so great. It's well articulated, but beloved, that type of prayer is not what Jesus, uh, encouraged us to do. It was to be secret. And when we are in the midst of the fellowship, we must be very careful because many people are judging prayer based on what they're hearing by these pretty much entertainers. This is entertainment prayer. This is not, you know, oftentimes true heartfelt prayer. It's competition. It instigates people to literally compete with one another. And the reason why most pastors put these people up on these microphones is because they are so eloquent because they have this strong voice and they're just so eloquent and smooth. But my beloved friend, it is a dangerous thing. And if you are in a church or you are a leader or quote feeder in a church setting, you need to cease all of that. We don't need to showcase anybody on no microphone because it does gender strife and emulation competition. Oh yes. But Beloved, here we go. We're looking at where Jesus said, go to your secret place and pray, pray. And what God sees you doing in private, he will openly reward. But then Jesus went on to tell us in Matthew chapter six, verse six, don't be like the pagans. Don't babble and go on and on and on with repetition, thinking that you shall be heard of God because you are doing these vain repetitions. This brings me to the uh, number one reason that many believers right now do not uh, have comfort in prayer and they are just struggling with it is because of prayer books, books that they are buying. You are purchasing prayer books and you are repetitively 
saying these prayers. These are someone else's thoughts, beloved, and you are repeating them over and over, and your prayer life is stale. It's, it, it's, it's like eating prepared food, packaged food. You can't eat that and be healthy, beloved, because it's prepared. It's man you factor. You don't want manufactured uh, uh, prayer uh, uh, prayers. You want to bring forth out of your own treasure, your own cares, your own burdens, your own questions, and the people you're praying for, and your own thanksgiving and praise. So this is one reason why many people are struggling with prayer. They are becoming uh, repetitive. It's boring and it's stale. Number two is a schedule. Once you set a schedule, beloved, you must understand that the Bible does tell us that Daniel, when Daniel Daniel was in distress over in this uh, a pagan uh, country where they had went into captivity. The Bible says he prayed morning, noon, and night. But we must understand that was what Daniel did. But the Spirit of God may not uh, uh, move in, in your heart that way to discipline yourself that way. We must learn to move in the Spirit with Christ and, and be comfortable that God is everywhere at all times and at any moment I can uh, uh Talk to God. So when you put yourself on a rigid schedule that I'm getting up every morning at 6 a.m., what if your body is tired and it is not having 6 a.m.? and you get up at 6.15, now what? You're under condemnation because you have set this schedule. And I need you to know and understand, beloved, it's just like a married couple. Who wants someone that's so rigid and regimented all the time? You you, you know, you would be like, you know, just say, for instance, your spouse say, you know, we're going to, you know, come together and be intimate at every morning before we go to work at 5.30. And you're like, but I want some now. I'm just saying, if it's the husband and the husband say he want to be intimate with you now and you're like, no, we got a meeting. We're scheduled for tomorrow morning. No, you got to move with it, go with it, flow with it. Intimacy between a husband and wife, it, it's honorable to God. So why would you make your spouse wait and, and you could feel him beckoning to want to be with you right now? So what if the Holy Spirit is moving you to, to come into your quiet space and worship and give God thanksgiving and you are so rigid and regimented, you're working eight hour shift at work, you refuse to move in your spirit and just quietly while you got that moment right in front of your computer to say, God, I love you. God, I thank you. Father, I pray for my boss. My boss right now is really pressing up on my nerves. God, help me. Give me strength. But you're like, no, I'll just do it when I get home. And so instead of you moving in that moment, you carry that burden for the rest of the day. But in the moment, you can feel that you should have just went on and emptied that out. But why not? Your schedule. Or when you just don't make the schedule, you're so condemned. Beloved, this will destroy your, 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 your relationship with, with God the Father because prayer is our communication. Number three is your position. People think that they have to be on their knees every time they pray. But what about the quadriplegic? What if that person has been injured and they cannot get down on their knees? So that person would not be qualified to talk to God because they cannot get down on their knees. So beloved, we have to get away from some of this man-made uh, jargon concerning prayer. Prayer is a heart thing. It's a heart thing. And what's in your heart comes out your mouth in faith. We go to God in prayer by faith. So, so do not be condemned if you don't always feel, uh, you know, in the moment to lay prostrate before God and worship and give God uh, thanksgiving and prayer and supplication. Don't get into bondage about that. Number four is your tone of voice. Some people feel that they got to whisper. And then some people, you know, they feel that if they're not forceful and thrustful and, you know, if, if, if they're not like just coming, coming, that they haven't really prayed. And beloved, this is deception. This will make your prayer life so complicated. No, God is spirit. And when we worship, when we pray, it's oftentimes it's coming straight from the heart. And number five, some people feel that they got to cry. And they got to speak in tongues every time that they pray. Beloved, sometimes it, what you're feeling, it doesn't warrant tears. If it does warrant emotion in that moment, so be it. But you don't need to cry to move heaven. You don't need to try to manipulate God with your emotions. We come to the Father and we come to him in faith. And, and if you are moved to cry, so be it. 
But beloved, stay away from all of this rigidness, making yourself feel some kind of way. We are accepted in the beloved. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, when he told them in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, he told them, when you pray, he said, go get quiet. And that means quiet in the spirit, in your heart. Get quiet. And oftentimes you could be in a room full of people and still be in a posture of prayer in your heart where you're not moving your mouth. But you're saying in your heart, God, I shouldn't have came to this group. This is a waste of my time. Lord, help me to be kind. Look, your spouse drug you there. You're like, I don't want to be here. Lord, help me to be. And you're saying this in your heart, to be gracious and kind because I don't want to be here. Give me an anointing, God, to just be sweet and kind. And before you know it, you pull in that strength because it glorifies God to be there for your spouse. So in your heart, you're right in the midst of others, but you're praying in your heart. And last but not least, I want you to know, because prayer is so complicated when you don't understand, we got to learn how to listen. And this is where many people fall short in receiving back that when, when you give God your cares, your burdens, and you question him, and you're praying for other people, you got to learn throughout the day to just stay close to God in your spirit, in your thoughts. Don't wander off. Stay close in your spirit. Keep your conscience on God. Keep your, your conscious mind that I'm on them. You know, I'm thinking about all the beauty around me or whatever you're doing. If you're doing an assignment at work, once you get that moment, recalibrate and just stay close to the Father so that you may hear his voice because Jesus, he clearly told us, beloved, and I'm a witness, Jesus does speak to us. And if we are so wayward in our heart and in our mind, the things that we're asking for and the things that we're seeking understanding, we can't never get it because our mind is always somewhere else. So we got to learn how to bring those thoughts in and keep ourselves close to him, abiding in Jesus, just like Jesus said, when we abide in him, because without him, we can't do anything. And without him and without hearing his voice, because he is the commander and the chief, he is Lord over our souls. He is the Lord over his harvest. He is the one that said, my sheep know my voice. And we can't know the voice and discern the voice if we are so, so busy. So we got to learn how to be quiet, beloved, in our inner man, in our spirit. Even if we're in the midst of many people, we learn to be quiet quiet in the inner man so we could get back those answers. We could get back instruction and we know what to do. Amen. I love you, beloved. I hope that these things help to edify you that prayer is the most beautiful thing we have been afforded because of the shed blood of Jesus. But don't put yourself in bondage. Walk with God. The Bible says Enoch and Noah walked with God. Let us walk with God without condemnation, without putting all these restrictions and burdens and yokes upon us. Because the word of God tells us, my beloved friend, as I close this exhortation, that Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden, it's light. God bless you, my friend. Come out of that condemnation. There may be days that you may not have nothing to say, but your ear is still inclined to, towards God to hear what he's saying. Come out of that bondage, beloved, and walk with God. Talk to God as you are moved in your inner man. Amen. God bless you. Till next time.